These were the daily scenes of the emergency health crisis in Liberia for more than a year. The Ebola virus outbreak saw thousands of people die. To save lives, time was of the essence. Acting quickly, but also taking safety measures was critical. Everyone was at risk. Uh, Liberia was not actually prepared. Uh, we underestimated all right, the potential and the impact of the effect of the virus. In the initial days of the outbreak, the West African country of about 4.6 million people was dealing with the fear of the unknown. The magnitude of the health crisis was yet to unfold. Sekou Kani's wife, a nurse, was infected with the Ebola virus as she treated patients. She died. 10th of September, thing became serious. I could no longer move, I could no longer walk. He went for various tests from typhoid to malaria, but tested negative. He self-medicated for a while before he almost succumbed to Ebola. I was taken to GFK ETU. There was our emitter. I entered that morning hour with about 15 persons entered along with me. But everybody died within two days. And I was there actually, we were not treated fairly. Seku was taken to a centre like this one, where Ebola patients were quarantined and treated. His life was saved. But emerging as an Ebola survivor created new challenges. So when I came out, I tried to meet other people. For a place that I passed, hey, a Ebola survivor, they come here. He well, he wept that from Ebola. He to have Ebola, he jacked off it you. So people try to stay away from me. So I have no alternative but to change community. With the virus and high death rates, a new community emerged, that of Ebola survivors. The UN Human Rights Office in Liberia monitored the crisis on the ground and launched an initiative called the Ebola Human Rights Watch, reporting on human rights issues arising from the crisis, both from a medical and the overall response perspective. The head of the office, Marcel Akpovo, emphasized the central role of the office in the humanitarian crisis to ensure fundamental rights of the people and their dignity. In the context of the protection cluster, the first entity, the first uh, framework and forum to raise the issue, the necessity of protecting the survivors and then ensuring that the discrimination and then stigma that they have been a uh, victim of uh, are taken into consideration by government in the measures that they are, they are, the government has taken to protect the overall people. It is our, our duty to ensure that uh, actions that are taken in the context of a humanitarian intervention and do reflect the need for accountability for the, for the affected population. And this is what happened. More than 4,000 people died in 2014 in Liberia and saving lives was critical. But it soon emerged that medical care need not be at the expense of human rights. Crisis like this uh, erupted. Um, most of the time, uh, the emphasis is put on uh, traditional uh, aspect of uh, uh, humanitarian actions, uh, food distribution, shelter, uh, physical protection, which are most of most of them uh, most of them are all material. Uh, but very least, very little attention is paid is paid to human rights. The crisis was coupled with a myriad of issues a health emergency, a humanitarian crisis, and access to basic human rights. The government acknowledges that they were overwhelmed, and the coordination, particularly on protection, led by the United Nations in bringing together all players to address the crisis, was critical. Yes, people are being infected. How do we prevent it? Uh, people are dying. How do you bury them? That was the biggest part of the entire thing. But now going downward and trying to understand some of those things that were happening were issues where, where, where some of the added value that was brought on from this entire collaboration, from this entire mechanism called the coordination mechanism that was put into place to make sure that human rights protection all right, was mainstream. The head of the UN mission in Liberia, Antonio Vigilante, said introducing a human rights approach to the crisis was crucial. We did start the protection cluster which was led by the High Commissioner for Human Rights because we felt the need that all the partners had to come together to identify and coordinate action in response to potential risks and um, uh, abuse or uh, infractions to the human rights. This was echoed by others. It's difficult to strike a balance between maintaining human rights and providing immediate assistance to um, people in need during a crisis um, because 
human rights can be derogated during a crisis, right? So that's what the Liberian state did. I think they imposed a state of emergency with limitations of basic rights, like freedom of movement, for instance. So it's difficult to strike a balance uh, sometimes, but there is an understanding more and more that uh, you cannot do humanitarian programs without using a human rights approach. With this support, the government started programs, including an economic recovery stabilization plan that was more sensitive to people's rights. For almost two years, from March 2014 to January 2016, Liberia was one of the three countries in West Africa that experienced the largest outbreak of Ebola in history, with more than 10,000 cases and 4,800 deaths. The World Health Organization has declared Liberia Ebola-free, but there have been sporadic flare-ups of the virus.